I think there's a way, you know, this show, and I've kind of said this to you a lot, is that I've learned so much from you during the, this process. I feel like it's, I've learned so much from artists when I work with them, but I think working so closely with you on a solo show, which is, this is my first solo show. So it's like, typically I'm doing group exhibitions. And so I'm thinking through my ideas with a group of artists. And so this, I've had to approach, you know, in concert with you and really take your lead. And one of the things that I've always been really interested in with your practice, I mean, A is just your eye, your eye for material and thinking about, I mean, you're, you nerd out on like what type of paper things are being printed on. <laughs> What are yeah. the colors that are sort of representing, let's say, diversity within the workspace? Yeah. Um, you know, you I've had so many different photo dumps of you just being in archives and sending me all of these amazing photos. And I've just been like, let's put this in the show. Like, this <laughs> research is fantastic. I really want to bring this in. And you've sort of uh, pushed back politely. Uh, <laughs> always, always. You know, in a way that has kind of reminded me that you know, the research portion of your, of your projects and your practice is separate in a lot of ways. And it does come into the gallery, but it comes into the gallery very considered. It comes into the gallery in really nuanced ways. And so I've just learned a lot thinking through maybe editing and thinking about, you know, the objects and you're kind of, everyone's seeing right now, you know, the objects that are within the exhibition and you're gonna see, you know, in the end, of series of works, there are six, <laughs> there's yeah. six series of works, you know, there aren't a ton of works, but those works take up a substantial amount of space. They hold themselves, they're incredibly formal, but they're also really rigorous and conceptual. Yeah, I mean, and to that point too, sort of this, uh, the way in which, you know, we, we dial back sometimes on sort of like what happens at the studio with sketches and research and all of that, you know, I wholeheartedly feel and like believe that like that history comes through your material choice and sensibil sensibility, you know, so whether that is the, you know, upholstery that is like literally like falling apart in the exhibition space because of its like sort of production value and its use value to, you know, and like this image using the 8020 system, which is in itself a modular construction that you see throughout architecture particularly in spaces of work, like those histories start to reveal itself through those choices. So, you know, doing that sort of work that is like unseen, I guess, in a way reveals itself again um, through the material choice and, and sort of sensibility. And so like, that's the great thing about like being an artist, right? Like you can work through so many different considerations and forms and come to like a conclusion about all the stuff you wanna talk about <laughs> through the material itself. Well, there's so much restraint. I think that's the thing that sort of, yeah. in your work. and I don't mean that in a bad way. It's like, there is so much restraint when it comes yeah. into what goes into the gallery space. And I, I, I think you and I both have the sensibility of not overstuffing and understanding that, you know, the things that you're talking about, you know, right now we're seeing kind of images of um, scraps of upholstery from CTA buses, you know, all of the labor histories, all of the spatial histories that go into these pieces are quite complex. But I think maybe we should start with the very first work within the exhibition is the titular work um, called Our Primary Focus is to be Successful. And that's a video piece. So when it comes back around, people will see um, of looking at diversity training initiatives. There's some texts that look, you know, sort of out of HR training videos, as well as, um, you know, footage that you shot within office spaces. I might be wrong. I believe this is, is this your first video that you've made or is this the? I've dabbled like, <laughs> like <laughs> early maybe video the one, but the, yeah, this is like literally like the, yeah. One of the first ones that I've made. Um, it was, it was interesting. Like, you know, I was kind of like uh, a lot of it was like learning as I went, but um, I really enjoyed it. And it was like appropriate to have this um, this video be a part of the language of this work because, you know, as I mentioned earlier, so much of the material that I was finding was text based, right? Like yeah. that in and of itself was like a form that um, circulated throughout like everything that I was finding. Um, in addition to these videos, so these training tutorial videos were some of the first things that I was finding that was like image based that just felt like super important, just the same. Um, that pictured the body in a very particular way that was supposed to be within like 
a work setting that we could all find familiar, but at the same time, you know, that this is all like sort of a stage representation of what should be happening. So, <coughs> excuse me. So the inclusion of the video uh, was super important in that it was uh, one of the few ways in which you saw that sort of figurative representation happen through these ideas of um, sort of uh, workplace policy and like labor history in a way too, because you sort of circulate through these ideas of like what's appropriate to say, what not to say, and that sort of like historical trajectory of how that changes over time is sort of um, intertwined in the, in the language. Um, that's uh, that seen as acceptable. Um, and there was this real interesting way in which the language that was being used to talk about training, to talk about diversity, um, all sort of circulated around efficiency and production and use value and um, you know making more money for a company and so forth. Um, and that to me had a lot of sort of overlap with a lot of the language I was defining about architecture and how spaces are built and specifically the architecture that happens within uh, spaces of work and sort of the, the accumulation of space, particularly space that goes up and that becomes modular um, over time. There's a lot of sort of overlap there. So for me, I was just finding these connections between thinking about built space, thinking about architecture in relationship to how we think about work and how we interact with each other in those spaces. Could you talk a bit about the soundtrack? Because we can't hear it right now, but it, yeah. I love the soundtrack. And I know uh, it's a polarizing soundtrack for some people, <laughs> but it sort of emanates across the entire space, which I really love. Yeah. Um, so it's on hold music that we oftentimes hear when we're waiting for, you know, the uh, the debt collector to pick up or that we're waiting for, you know, that other <laughs> that other line to pick up from, you know, whoever we're calling. Um, but it's very familiar. Um, I'm not gonna sing it, but it's <laughs> it's pretty <laughs> mundane and, and, and sort of routine. Um, at least I've heard it a lot. Um, and I believe from a lot of the material that I was finding, that sort of like hold music became part of uh, like commonplace within offices, like late 80s, like 90s or so forth. You would start hearing that hold music sort of interchange when you had like, you know, the larger operating systems or larger uh, phone connecting systems. And so that resonates as the entire soundtrack of the seven and a half minute video. And then there are like points where um, then you start to hear what's actually happening in the office spaces that I was filming in. And so you'll get like maybe two and a half minutes of that amp of that um, audio. I think it's also the official hold music for Comcast, which is one of the largest employers <laughs> in Philadelphia, funny enough. I came across a little research saying that, <laughs> you know, one of the things that's been kind of funny about organizing this show with you. And I, you know, I kind of talk about the fact that you and I have known each other for so long, but we rarely are in the same place at the same time. And so, you know, we've done a couple studio visits, but a lot of us, you know, we really communicate just via text. That's how a yeah. lot of this exhibition has sort of occurred. And also just kind of working on, you know, really flat 2D PDFs. That's how we sort of laid out this exhibition. But while we were in this space together, you sort of had this offhand comment about how the show was laid out. And I have to say that you know, the show was laid out maybe a year in advance. I don't remember exactly how yeah. long, but very few things have changed from this exhibition. Um, maybe a couple things were edited out, but we really had a great sense of like what the works were pretty, um, pretty much from the jump. But while we were in this space, you sort of described it as an office floor plan. And I thought it was super interesting that, you know, you, you walked in and you were like, you know, the first room, which has our primary focus is to be successful, feels like the waiting room, um, the room that we're sort of peeking into right now that has, you know, hope labor, which are those green pieces, as well as those wall paintings, um, problem sets you kind of described as the, the office space, <laughs> the ICA's high space, which has these like giant ceilings, um, you described as the utility closet, and then we're kind of in the space that you now described as, as the outdoors. And I was super intrigued, and it was one of those things that you learn so much about an exhibition once you're in the space and there's so much to be learned once you actually see the works in concert with each other. But you're an artist who's very interested in architecture, kind of constantly thinking through architecture theory. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, knowing this about this process of the show, would you kind of move forward and think about maybe the design and floor plans of your exhibition sort of architecturally in a similar sense? 
Yeah, I, that's all really great questions. Um, and you're right, like you don't really see any of this or feel it until you're actually in the space and you start seeing those visual connections being made. Like you have them in your head or you have them on like, you know, some small little maquette, but until you really see everything in space is when it really comes together. And I think I've always sort of thought about the relationship of work to the exhibition site, you know, like when things travel or when things are shown in different spaces, to me, it's never like the same. And you're always making considerations for um, the site itself and what it can hold. And I particularly think like with the After Willis series, um, that really sort of inspired ways of thinking about space for me and the architecture of a site in different ways. Like for that work, for example, it only holds the amount of seats that can actually like fit that wall and mm -hmm. they're all like very particular. And so like even these upholstery works that we're seeing on the floor here, like this is the biggest I've ever shown them and this many and stacked. So there's a way in which the site could hold it. And I think um, moving forward, it's always definitely um, sort of a consideration for how um, how the work like has a life of its own and how it can yeah. like, sort of talk back to the space. Like those things are always in, in conversation with one another, like the work and, and, and the actual um, exhibition site. I think one of the things that has really surprised me in working with you and not just like talking through your practice is the fact that you're working with really strict systems. You know, you're thinking about systems, you're thinking about structures, but you're not that type of person. <laughs> you're actually really flexible. And I think one of the things that I've been sort of intrigued by with this, with this exhibition is, you know, I frame this as a survey, but it was important that it was also a survey that I mean, let's just say your, your gallery in New York, Martos, I wanted to make sure not to show the same works that have been shown in New York. So it is a survey, but at the exact same time, um, I think that there's a lot of kind of new and reinterpretations of works. And I find that really sort of intriguing in the way that um, let's say Blanks, which was a piece that we kind of originally looked at from 2018 and it's not yeah. in the exhibition, but Blanks is sort of um, similar to the pieces that are appearing in depreciating assets yeah. um, in that they're, you know, sort of these photocopies all stacked within a box, you sort of rethink that work and you expand that work to create a new work called problem sets. And problem sets are these um, paintings that you all are going to see on the wall that are these cartoons that were, um, you know, really illustrating whether the government was successful or not in implementing affirmative action. I mean, I want to talk about problem sets and really get into the idea yeah. around that piece, but I want to maybe begin by thinking about your ways of rethinking and revisiting works within your own practice. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and I think it kind of starts back to the question prior when we're thinking about the space, um, sort of the architecture, like what can a space hold? Um, what can materially happen differently with the work? Um, and so, for me, it's like really important, and I think I mentioned this earlier, just like working through different media because these questions about labor, site, race, um, the workplace in general, they all exist in different forms, in different materials. Mm -hmm. So it's for me really important to like make that known and announce it within an exhibition space. And I think this like flipping sort of back and forth between the material, like, Blanks, for example, um, the covers felt like super important um, just as a material alone. Like I wanted to re sort of invest in like the material site that it actually comes from, meaning like paper, meaning like, you know, the copy room. So, you know, in that work, I was like super interested in that site being in relation to the actual like form. Um, and I think that was shown that has not been shown within like a, an exhibition site proper, but like when it has been shown, it was like those box, those cardboard boxes, the form of like the actual um, like book, you know, sort of uh, that they come in, like that holds the site, you know, that gives the relationship back to like uh, an office or copy coffee room. And as we like think through problem sets uh, for the, or when I thought through problem sets for this exhibition, 
you know, again, like I could play with a scale. I could, I could think about like the relationship of seeing these and sort of like a, a bodily, like sort of reaction to these things that are again, supposed to be like representative of um, what sort of like playing itself out. And so I had all this white space of the wall and it's like, well, that in and itself could be a nod to paper that in and of itself could, you know, take us back to like different sites of uh, reproduction or the residual where you see a lot of the marks from the um, ex excessive copying that happened over time with these uh, works. So there were different ways in which I started to realize like this work could be represented that felt appropriate uh, for this exhibition. Could you talk a little bit about like what is actually happening within problem sets? Yeah, so they're weird. Um, I just have to say, like, they are weird illustrations. Yeah. They're very weird illustrations. And so I think what's like pretty cool about them is like finding those illustrations wouldn't have happened without that backhand work, backhand, that other back work of like research, you know, like those are like literally hidden. Unless you're like, oh, I'm going to go to the government accounting website and I'm going to search for, you know, like there, it's just like a lot of like searching through, searching through, and then you find it and you're like, oh, wow, this exists. Um, so the four that you see there were taken from reports in, the, I believe it was the 70s, uh, like 72 or something like that, or 74, when they were first starting, to, they, meaning the government, was first starting to implement affirmative action more broadly into different government departments um, of the United States government. And so these were sort of uh, illustrations that were pointing to sort of, you have the, um, I, I should back up, you have these government reports, they're like 20 pages or something long. You would see these illustrations on the left and then the right hand page would be like matrix of some sort or best practices of some sort of how to like implement these sort of changes. And so I guess these were supposed to be like lighthearted like puns at the time um, that were um, pointing to the fact that they weren't quite at the goal or they're trying to get to the goal. Um, and I will say probably the 70s was the last time I saw an illustration within, within any of these uh, reports. I'm assuming they didn't go over well. So <laughs> those are a few of the ones that I sort of sussed out um, from the ones that I was finding. But yeah, they were sort of um, illustrative of what they weren't doing. So there was this interesting dynamic where like you have these graphs and charts, numbers, um, some text for best practices, and then you have these sort of uh, illustrations, excuse me, summing up um, what those charts and graphs were. I think it's more than just the ones that we're seeing within the exhibition. You know, we looked yeah. at, and I kind of feel like at least the ones that you um, uncovered, you're kind of maybe seeing two cartoonist hands or two illustrators hands, at least I might recognize. And it's just, it's so bizarre. And it's one of those things that part of me just feels as if, um, cause there's not a lot of visuals in these documents, at least the yeah. documents that you sort of provided to me in the research. And I think there's a way in which they're trying to visualize information for people who might not care about diversifying their workplace. So instead of actually reading the report, you just get a cartoon that, you know, women and people of color are trailing behind. Right. Very, very much so. Like, it's a very quick read, a very quick sort of like assessment of the state of like the Department of, you know, the interior or something like that. Um, yeah, I think that that is sort of a fair reading of like how, how those sort of like manifested as as documents. I'm wondering, Jessica, you know, you talk a lot about labor history. You're thinking a lot about um, theory within your work, but at the same time, you're an incredibly formal artist. And I think from knowing you really well, um, or at least knowing you through the show, I know that you're often referencing art history and you're sort of playing with art history. But anytime that I ask you about, you know, what artists you're looking at or who you like, I, I always sort of assume this like share love of minimalist, hyper-industrial, you know, sort of masculine artists. But at the same time, you and I both love, you know, Charlotte Pazinski's work. But you have like a very sort of um, diverse and divergent group of artists that you're looking at. Um, you often reference Alan Sekula as an artist that you're um, really interested in. But I think the one I'm always, you know, um, perplexed, interested <laughs> by is Pope L. Pope L comes up so often for you. And I'm wondering, you know, some of it makes me think about 
all of the different materials that you're playing with. I feel like there's a way in which when I look at this show, you're not working with the same material twice. You know, you're sort of working with very distinct things and then you move on to the next. And yet at the exact same time, I understand it to be a Jessica Vaughn sculpture or a Jessica Vaughn photograph. And I'm wondering, you know, just how you think through that process, how you're looking at art history, how are the people that you're looking at sort of influence some of your decisions of how you work with, with your materials? Yeah, that's a really good question. Yes, that's very generous, very diverse group of artists that I'm really <laughs> sort of uh, invested in, um, you know, being inspired by. And I think that is because it's like the ideas that they're really engaged and invested in. I think for me, it always sort of like starts there. And then, you know, I just sort of like play around with material and like figure it out, you know, trial and error, you know, have fun with it. You know, again, like that's what I really enjoy about being an artist is just like, you know, getting to make the thing that I want to make um, just through exploring different things and, and that being a form of research in and of itself. Um, you know, the Pope L thing, you know, I think there's just such a sensibility with like, you know, the materiality of it, like, like the peanut butter or the mayonnaise or the ketchup that he uses. That's just so like visceral, mm -hmm. and residual. Um, I'm so tight and neat. They're not, you know, it's just like, but you know, you, you see these sort of like overlapping ways in which, um, the material can just like just hold so much weight and that's mm -hmm. just so exciting to like have that moment in the studio where you realize oh the material is doing just like all of this stuff um that i want to say but i can just do that and like in a photograph or i can do that you know by procuring a lot of um you know upholstery scraps so you know there's just just there's just this way in which i think sort of the diversity of languages that come into my practice is through like centrally trying to figure out these those larger um i guess global for lack of a better word like questions about like what is labor like what does that look like how is my sort of experience in, in, interpreted through this history that has been like marked and studied over time you know like how do you insert yourself into those conversations and you know apply your own sort of like logic to it. And so I think that for me, exciting art, like the artists that I'm really excited about are doing that. And it doesn't matter like sort of the material they're working with. Mm -hmm. um, so there yeah. is no casual material for you. You know, it's like, I have to, I mean, this is clearly a type, right? <laughs> Anyone that's looking at this understands that, you know, you and I might be type A people. And so I think there's a way that, you know, <laughs> everything has uh everything has been thought about but i do i do think that i mean a couple things first off you're much more playful in the space than you know i think people would anticipate i think there's a lot of unexpected colors that sort of appear even just that red rug kind of when you walk in there's um there's play and there's like a cheekiness that, you know, there's sort of a wink and a nod that I really appreciate to your work. And I think a lot of my favorite artists, you know, are very serious, rigorous artists with, um, you know, intense research practices. And yet when you come into this space, it's like, oh, this orange carpeting with these like really interesting mounts. It's like how you're thinking through video, how you're thinking through the space. But even just that like seafoam green, it's like all of these like kind of small minute details that sort of shift your perspective um, on a work. And so I think in some ways, when I look back at those art historical references, I also see some of that like cheeky play, particularly with Popel, um, you know, coming back into your practice. But I also wonder, and Jessica, you and I have not talked about this and you can push back as much as you like, but I wonder so much of your practice is thinking about the erasure of us as marginalized people, as women within office spaces. But at the exact same time, a lot of your work seems to me in line with 60s, 70s minimalism, which is inherently sort of dominated by like white straight cis males. And so I am wondering if you're thinking about you know, some of that form of invisibility with the materials that you're choosing, it might be explicit, it might not be, but I'm just wondering, you know, is that something you're thinking about, at least yeah. when thinking through not only the material, but the references that you're kind of referencing from? Yeah, I think there's a bit of that, like, you know, you think of that time period, right? And 
a lot of the artists from that generation, there's never really attention paid to the fabrication methods that they were using in relationship to the actual labor structures that were like sort of unpinning themselves during that generation that we still obviously live with today because much of our labor policy has not changed since the 1960s, 70s. Um, like there's never sort of a conversation between um, those sort of, uh, like social structures. Um, and so I think there's that, that sort of uh, way of working through the material is I think important to suss out, um, you know, cause when we think about civil rights history that generation, generationally sort of came up with, you know this sort of assembly line production and a lot of this sort of modular architecture that we see today and they're inherently entwined Mm -hmm. to how we we think about production so there is that um sort of overlap there too um and i'm sorry what was the the second part of the question sorry <laughs> well, i was ad-libbing i don't even remember the second part. Um, <laughs> sorry i guess i'm just thinking about the insertion of bodies and histories and i think you know this yeah. show does have a lot of there's more figurative work than i think yeah, there's definitely more than I usually, I, yeah. I even typically sort of like get into, but, and I think that was so important because like this sort of knowledge and tertiary work is never seen as something that has a, a, a sort of bodily relationship just in, and also too, even when we think about like assembly line production, we always think that there's just a, uh, a machine there and mm -hmm. people are actually like, you know, fundamentally uh, running those things. And so there, I wanted this sort of like push and pull between um, the sort of the tax heavy things that I was finding. And then, you know, actually that like bodies do exist in the space and, and make these things known. So, you know, there's a play between the two um, mm -hmm. through thinking through material as being material, meaning like the physical things that exist in the space outside of the body. Um, and then also, you know, people themselves who inhabit it. And so, you know, there's a lot of a lot of ways in which I thought that that could be possible in this exhibition, and one was sort of also that lingering music from the video <laughs> that sort of circulates throughout the space, even though you're not in that first room. Um, having that sort of like linger and be like sort of the watchful thing that happens or interacts with all of the pieces um, was again something I didn't really think too much about until we were physically installing, but like sort of became known as even more of this like sort of omnipresent sort of like body that is like you know the ethos of the of the exhibition in terms of I think the feel of everything. Totally. The work that we're looking at right now is entitled Irrational Rest and I feel like it's marking a turn in your practice. I feel like it's hmm. uh I, I mean I don't want to put pressure on you sorry to say that it is but I feel like it's a new way of working at least having seen your work for the past five years this feels like maybe a departure. And this is a 12 by 15 foot sculpture that you sort of have already referenced being modular. It's built out of an 80 20 system. And then these are refurbished office lights. But I think, you know, in a lot of ways, you know, this piece, at least for me, sort of disrupts the structure, the regimentation, your orientation of even being in an office space and thinking about the regimentation of, you know, electric lights and what it means to sort of have those to be able to work. And so can you talk a little bit about, you know, the mode of working here, which to me feels like a shift, but also moving forward kind of with this style of work. So I know that you're going to be making a piece very similar for another museum. Yeah. Um, for me, it was really important to work with some sort of like immaterial um, thing that exists in spaces of work. And that in this instance was like light. Um, you know, I was sort of gathering all this material like text, upholstery and all of that. But then I wanted to work with something that, you know, the worker like doesn't really have control over, <laughs> like when we're in these spaces and that being um, the light itself and, and what it sort of generates. Um, so there's that. And then I did want to play with this sense of like automation. Again, something that like is ne not necessarily seen as attached to the body um, mm -hmm. in the spaces of work, but is ultimately so those two sort of combinations, like working with something that um, is immaterial, that is not necessarily in the worker's control, um, and the sensibility of something like shifting over time, 
in the absence of a, a, a hand or a worker um, was something that was like of real interest to me. Um, the building out of something this large is, is, is definitely new to me, um, working in this way where, where I was like kind of like removed at times and then not from the work was, was definitely different, um, you know, just given the pandemic and so forth. Um, but yeah, I would say definitely like the scale of it and like working um, with a material that isn't something that you necessarily touch all the time, but like you experience. Um, yes, to your point, I think that that is, a, that is definitely a shift for me, but, you know, trying to link these, these things that, um, oftentimes are, as, are seen as like, sort of, oh, it just happens to be there, but not necessarily considered, um, was important in the exhibition. Totally. And I don't think this is a, I should say, I don't think this is a departure in a negative way. I just think oh, there's yeah. a way, you know, within this show, I think it's an ambitious show. And I think it's a show that, you know, you and I have talked about what is required for certain artists and for particularly i'm going to say as a sculptor yeah the space to realize something to this scale and so it's one of those things where when you're operating within let's say a gallery space or these sort of like smaller exhibition spaces you don't have a chance just to even like stretch your limbs get a sense of like how you operate within a space and not every single artist needs a lot of space, but right. it was interesting sort of working with you and being like, oh, well, Jessica actually like <laughs> needs a lot of space to sort of take up, but at the same time, just to allow the work to breathe. And if you enter the, the museum, there's a lot of, there's a lot of wall space. There's a lot of sort of like, you know, sort of white walls that you get a chance to really like breathe through. And we're coming up really close to, let me just say, uh, the, the Q&A, but I have one more question for you, Jessica. And Natalie, do you mind scrubbing back actually to the second gallery? Um, Jessica has teased me that it's been uh, very clear that I have a favorite room in the show because um, yes. I spent all of my time in it right here. Okay, keep going. Just hit play. Yeah, Wait. it's gone. I I have a favorite room in this exhibition. It's the room that I've spent the most time in. Um, and it's just the works that I really love. And it's this space right here. Um, it's a second gallery, the one that you described as the office space. And I want to talk about the works on the floor, um, yeah. Hope, Labor, Folded and Flat. But before that, I want to say something that I really love about your practice um, and something I really love when thinking about your work is that oftentimes in museums, particularly with Black artists and artists of color, there is a way in which the exhibition space can sort of abstract the ideas that the artists are working with. It's like the things that they're talking about are not here, they're like in a distant place. But for you, the things that you're talking about around labor, around capitalism, around the office space and admin work, you know, thinking about white collar work in a lot of ways, you know, appear within the third floor of the ICA. You know, it's like there yeah. is this way in which, you know, shout out to all the admins from the ICA tuning in tonight. You know, it's like <laughs> the labor that made the show possible is happening here. And so I want to talk really quick about this piece because I think it also points to a lot of the things you do as, as, a, as a sculptor and as an artist. And so I'm sorry, I don't want to double down on you being a sculptor. I feel like I'm arguing this point tonight for some odd reason, but like as an artist making these works, they're coming out of research that you've done on the Occupational Information Network, which is the nation's largest vocational training. And will you talk a bit about, you know, what these assessment tools are, how you're thinking about this and the material you've shifted them to in the gallery space? Sure. So I wanted them to both exist I wanted the hope labor pieces to exist in the space with the cartoons because they're coming from a same sort of like language of like paper. So the ONET um, sort of profile examination um, exists as like the set of problems that you get or um, training guide where you have this perforated green cutout shapes that you sort of um, orient to specific uh, directions that are given within the actual evaluation. So there are a series of correct answers for the shapes that you would make. Um, and once you sort of um, make these shapes and create them, you can assess sort of like your, your, your skills for spatial relationship to understanding um, how things essentially sit in space, but from the perspective of like um, a working environment. And so then it can help sort of guide you 
um, along sort of a trajectory of, of a uh, occupation that you would maybe suit yourself, that you would find yourself like, you know, perfect fit for. Um, so along with this training guide for like sort of this spatial assessment, there's also a series of other questions that sort of align you to a particular occupation. And so um, I wanted to create Hope Labor with actual aluminum because it nods back to thinking about vocational work um, and also thinking about like assembly line production when you're making things on like a CNC. And, you know, I also wanted to like tweak around what those actual problem sets would actually be, or I should say the actual <clears throat> um, correct uh, ways of folding that paper. So I wanted to sort of screw with that logic and create these folds and um, representations that were not exactly what the guide was looking for. Mm -hmm. I think this question sort of connects in some ways, Jessica, and this is coming from Fred. Hi, Fred. It's a little long, so I'm going to give it to you maybe in a couple pieces. I always have a hard time with Q&A of trying to cut the question down. But Fred says, um, when they were in the show, they were struck by the resonance between the work and the present labor of the museum guards and also the various utilitarian objects throughout the gallery. So he's thinking about uh, the squishy pads that the guards stand on, which I don't think those fatigue pads might have been in the space when we were installing, but they do enter once the show opens. Yeah. Um, there's also a bunch of social distance markers that the ICA currently has up uh, because of COVID. Uh -huh. um, and even the security cameras. Um, Fred is wondering if you could speak to your experience of those elements as you installed the show and how you think about those things in general as you bring your work into institutions that are very much workplaces. Yeah, that's a good question. So I, I did catch a glimpse of them when I came to see the show after install. Um, and I think that they worked themselves out in interesting ways like when we were speaking earlier about like sort of my my flexibility with like putting up work um i don't get too caught up in like the things that actually already exist there like i'm not so much interested in covering up the language or the structures that are within the exhibition space itself because you know i'm pulling so much from what already exists in the world that like it's good that they're actually in dialogue with those security cameras or you know the mats that exist on the floor um so yeah i think it's really important that those relationships are seen um and that they exist side by side so i wasn't uh, too bothered by them you know it, it's it's interesting because i do make a lot of work that resides on the floor <laughs> so there's always you know that assumption that it's going to be butting up against something else um so yeah, I like to see that relationship live in space and, and have a, a conversation that starts to develop. I don't see it as a distraction or anything like that. Yeah, because a lot of the works, it's interesting because there's, once you install the show, when we're installing it, it's very different than actually being within the show as a lived experience. Because there's also right. you know tape added that's kind of placed to make sure that people don't walk directly on your sculptures. And as a curator, you know I hate that stuff. I always, I never <laughs> want any of that near the objects. And so we right. compromise saying that if anyone crossed this sort of invisible line, we put it down and I heard in the first hour it was down, you know, it was like one of those <laughs> things to protect your work. Yeah. Um, but it's interesting even coming into, you know, we're, we're talking about the publication right now and something we haven't talked about. We've talked a lot about the photography, but we haven't talked about, you know, some of the edits where certain artists also want the fire exit sort of taken out or the security camera taken out. And it's like suddenly you have this sort of, um, I don't know, false space, the space that like isn't as accurate to like, what the actual space of the exhibition is and i'm not you know committed to yeah documentation yeah i mean i think it's like a diff to me personally i think the like the language of like a book per se is different than that of like an actual exhibition where people like walk in and and sort of shift through the space so you know again i'm flexible but <laughs> i do think that um you know in the exhibition itself i don't get too you know caught up with like with that language, the language of, you know, of the building itself um, getting in the way as some may think uh, with the work because it, you know, these works themselves are, are in conversation with that language. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I'm just going to say we have about nine minutes. So if anyone else has questions, please submit. But I'm going to keep talking to Jessica uh, okay. <laughs> as they come in. Um, you know, Jessica, my colleague Karen Patterson from the uh, Fabric Workshop Museum saw the show and said that it was really haunting. Um, they were surprised at how haunting the exhibition was. And I think, you know, something we have not talked about at, at all today, but we've talked about, you know, during the run of the show is, is the context of COVID and the fact that we're not in office spaces. And I, I do feel, I, I would want to say the show is somber, but um, yeah, I don't, I'm trying to find a word better than haunting. You know, I felt like Karen really kind of hit the nail on the head with that. I think there is sort of a hauntingness when you're in the space and, and seeing all of these very familiar objects in sort of these unfamiliar ways. And I guess I'm just wondering, what was that experience like? I don't want to force you at all to speak to COVID since such we're in the moment, mm -hmm. but, you know, inherently this show was topical and it was hard, you know, sort of not to have that type of context and, and really also to like push back and make sure that your work didn't seem responsive to this right. moment either. And so I'm just wondering what that experience was like for you. Yeah, um, that's a really good question. Definitely still processing it um, as we're still in the midst of it. Uh, you know, a lot of people have asked me like, so, you know, as COVID sort of unpins us from the architecture that we know of the office, like, you know, how do you think you'll re-represent or represent or speak to the new spaces we find ourselves working in, which for many people potentially doing tertiary work that's not frontline, it's like at home. And to me, I feel like, you know, a lot of the, these structures still exist because these structures are part of these, the, the sort of larger conversation about like how we treat workers. Mm -hmm. and. To me, I don't think that because we've, you know, removed ourselves from office buildings or spaces that a lot of this language has um, sort of dissolved or evaporated. Like, I, I, I do still think the ways in which uh, we still talk about how labor should get done or how efficient it should get done um, still exists, um, given that that sort of policy or that sort of way in which um, it's capitalized on is still very much present in today's structure, even with the pandemic. Certainly. I do wonder though, thinking about your practice that the material has shifted though. You know, I think there's a place where you can kind of come back and be like, well, the material has actually changed. Do you have any interest in that at all? I mean, I think the light, sort of that immaterial quality of light is I think super important and still something that I am, you know, trying to discover and figure out. Um, in my own practice. And then also, you know, thinking about or playing with, I should say, not thinking about, but playing with sound mm -hmm. in and of itself and how that sort of resonates through space um, in, re in relationship to work too. So yeah, I think there's still like a lot of um, material things that um, are still um, readily to be explored in, in my practice. Mm -hmm. Well, I always appreciate just your ability to, I don't want to say just try new things, but really to think through, um, I think with this light work, with a rational rest, there's a way that I really just appreciate your ability to take something that's a little more abstract and really yeah. think about, particularly just the thinking about the standardization of lighting and how that historically has shifted workers from the outdoors indoors, which I think is very complicated and it's sort of hard to sort of express to people in a 150 word label. Right. Um, and so that type of like Im immateriality sort of like comes through within that piece. Yeah, I mean that total shift, right? Like it allows us to work 24 seven essentially. Um, and we could even say that about Zoom or having like a computer that you can access from anywhere. It allows us to, you know, be constantly working just the, just the same. Um, yeah, so I there are definitely ways in which uh, sort of our notions of like how we get things done or the efficiency of it shift with like the technology or the way that we sort of encompass architecture for sure. Um, but it's also very interesting how we don't actually shift the conceptual framework or the feeling of work given the spaces, right? Like the space has changed, but somehow we still have the same sort of comfort in um, thinking that work should be produced in the same way. Absolutely. No, totally. I felt like our conversation with Nikhil definitely got to some of those points yeah, during, yeah. during the opening. 
Um, Jessica, it's such a pleasure always having you. Um, I'm a slightly confused, Natalie. I can see someone has raised their hand, but I'm not sure. I'm sorry, I'm not super well versed in 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 Zoom. And it's kind of there's a couple hand raised questions. Can we select them or? I don't see a question in the chat, so I guess I just have to say, if you have a question, please uh, put that in the chat. And I'll give people just a minute to do that. But Jessica, you know, this is kind of also just kind of an off the cuff kind of question right before yeah. we close. And it's something I haven't asked you before, especially when thinking through exhibition texts and having, um, you know, prepared this in kind of concert with you. But what's your one takeaway that you'd want people to walk away from the show with? That's a hard question. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess it's like, I hope people experience like a very slow read of the work, you know, like I want people to take their time through the exhibition and feel like the sort of like drag <laughs> through yeah. each of the spaces and that feel of the work. So. Totally. And I feel like, you know, as a curator and thinking spatially, you know, you're a person that's thinking a lot through choreography. You know, I think there's a lot of um, really interesting choreography sort of at play within this exhibition. And as much as you sort of talk about, you know, text being, you know, the beginning point, there really isn't a lot of text within this. And so a lot of that type of drag that you're talking about or sort of the, you know, um, temporal sort of pacing that you've created within the show, which really just has to be experienced and sort of felt. I, I don't think you can quite see that on the on the 3D tour. You know, a lot of that is is really just done through objects, which is yeah. really impressive. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Cool. Thank you all so Thank much. You. Thank you, Jessica. Um, I hope you all are able to check out the show. And if not, please, again, um, check out the 3D tour. And next week on Wednesday, we'll be screening William Greaves uh, in the Company of Men. Thank you all so much. Thanks. Take care.